welcome to Two Boomer Women. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking with Boomer Women for almost a decade now. (laughs) Well, I guess I've been talking to Boomer Women all my adult life. Uh, Reinventing myself several times along the way, though, but always focused on us, Boomer Women. With this incarnation of Two Boomer Women, I'll be interviewing other women who have a message of interest for our demographic. If you want to hear about or learn about something specific, let me know and I'll find someone who understands us to talk about it. There's a contact page at twoboomerwomen.com. If you want to be a guest on Two Boomer Women, bring it on. There's an application form at the website, too. Finally, this show is all about conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. So let's get started with today's show. Welcome to the Two Boomer Women Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Money. It's my experience people either have no filters or it's a taboo subject. I was brought up to never ask what someone made or what they paid for something. And to this day, I wouldn't dream of asking or telling about income, but I'm okay if someone asks me what something costs. As long as it's in the spirit of more, oh, I like that. May I ask how much it costs as opposed to, crikey, I wonder how much she paid for that. (laughs) I personally very carefully phrase my requests for the price of something. I try to say, gee, if you don't mind me asking, how much would I pay for something like that? It's because of the taboos that so many people reach adulthood without any real education around things financial. I don't think my guest today has many of the hang-ups as she coaches on money, our habits around it, our knowledge about it, and our agility with budgets and debt, and the conversations we should be having with the people who are affected by all of the aforementioned. Alisa Locke, welcome to the Two Boomer Women podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and having this conversation with you. I'm really looking forward to, to it, primarily because too many Boomer people have that taboo attitude. So this will be really, really good. Yeah. I read your bio, and it would appear that your entire career has been spent in one part of the financial world or another. Can you tell us more about you? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, It certainly wasn't a career that I um, intentionally set out to do, you know, work in the field of insurance and financial services, but I somehow landed there, and it was a place that was just a great fit Uh, for me. So you're right. My entire career was spent in uh, something having to do with finances, whether it was mortgages or insurance or uh, financial planning. And I'm now a financial coach. And I'm sure we'll get more into that in a little bit. And I uh, love your intro, by the way. Uh, So many things to talk about there. So very excited for this entire conversation. (laughs) Okay. And you may, in that case, be pleased to know that before we close, I always say, gee, is there there anything we haven't discussed? So um, if if there is something, be sure to jump in when I, when I, before I close. Um, Now, needless to say, I have some questions for you, but I do want to clarify to our listeners that you're in the United States. I'm in Canada. Your career and business are in the U.S., There's probably similarities, some parallels, but if any of our listeners are in one country or the other, or even another country, that they might need to fine tune this information dependent on their own country. Would you agree? Yes, and I'm um, that is correct, and I'm glad you made that you know kind of caveat to the conversation. But I will tell you that as a money coach, I work with people as much on their mindset and their relationship with their money as what they're actually doing with their money. And the mindset and relationship piece is universal. So uh, no matter whether your listeners are in the United States or Canada or any country around the globe, I think they'll find a lot of value in listening in. Yeah. And thank you for sort of clarifying that part too, because I know because I talk to so many people from the States and Canada, if it gets into some specific blah, specifics, like, you know, you talk about your 401k, I talk about my RRSP, you know, like to somebody who doesn't talk a lot of financial stuff, it's like, what are, you, what are they talking about? So, but yeah, no, mindset is where we're going today for sure. 
I'd like to start at the very beginning. You just mentioned you were a financial coach. What's the difference between a financial coach and a financial advisor? Oh, great question. And one that I get very often. And I will tell you that financial coaches and financial advisors very often work hand in hand. So here's the difference between uh, these two professions. A financial coach works with people who are struggling in some way with their, their mindset around money, which is their emotions around money, their beliefs around money, their philosophies around money, their money story, which is the messages that they heard around money growing up, right? And all of those things impact their behavior with money, their ability to save for the future, you know, their um, spending habits, how they talk about money and communicate, you know, um, you know, how they manage their everyday finances. That's the wheelhouse in which I, I work. Um, whereas a financial advisor is going to really help you plan your financial future from a standpoint of helping you invest right, in the way that is appropriate for you and your risk tolerance, which is basically how you feel about risk. And they're going to help you put that financial plan together. And so we very often work hand in hand. And, and I will tell you that earlier in my career, I had all the designations, all the letters after my name to be a financial planner. And I, I worked in that world. And I think that that has given me a really unique perspective in what I do now, because while I don't give financial advice and I don't sell any investment products, I understand kind of what the end goal is and how I can work with my financial advisor partners. Okay. And as you were speaking, it occurred to me that I think where I was sort of waffling back and forth between the two is last year, 2021, early in the year, I had interviewed a Canadian financial advisor mm. about sort of that retirement planning and pre-retirement stuff. So I think I was just sort of not, not really clear on the two, but you've made it really clear. So thank you for that. That's great. great. Now you've talked about money mindset. And from those, that little bit you said, it sounds like it's a really big umbrella, but can we start to unpack that? Can you tell us a little bit more? Sure, sure. You know, money mindset, as I kind of alluded to before, is really the attitude and our, the relationship that we have with money. And it all starts from what I call your money story, which are the messages that we all heard as children, as teenagers, maybe even young adults around money. And so our first memories of around money is probably, you know, doing things like going to the grocery store with our mom or dad, right? And asking for special cookies that we saw or some candy. And, you know, we might have heard, oh, we can't afford it, right? That's a message that we're, we're hearing around money. So we, we see and hear and internalize these messages around money from our parents, from our environment, from our peers, right? It can even be from the culture that we have or our religion. And so these messages that we hear um, around money as a child formulate as an adult, these attitudes and philosophies and emotions that we have around our money, which in turn dictate our behavior, so I'll give you an example, okay? When I was a little girl, I always thought that we were poor. We were not. We were solidly middle class. But the reason that I always thought we were poor is we lived in an extremely wealthy town. So in comparison to my peers, I felt like I had less than. Also, my parents were big savers, Right. So they lived a fairly frugal life so they could save and invest for the future. And so the messages I heard were messages around scarcity. Right. We can't afford it. We don't have money for that. No, we're not going to spend money on that. So as an adult, when I got out into the workforce and I started earning money, 
because I had this scarcity mindset and I felt like I had been deprived, I spent, 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 and I got into a lot of debt and I didn't save and I was just spending in order to feel that money was buying the things that I felt like I lacked as a child. Sometimes when we feel less than, we tend to spend more than. And that's exactly what happened. And when I found myself a divorced single mom in my early 30s, it was kind of a a real awakening for me. And I realized that if I didn't change my relationship with money, I was never going to kind of get out of this financial situation. And so that's just an example of how money mindset impacts our behavior in such a huge way. So now I want to take a break from our conversation and go like, oh boy, where do I figure in this? Because just, I, I, I think as a child, I did grow up in a, in a home where we were poor, but I also lived in a little tiny town. And so high school stopped at grade eight. So my mother's job, basically, she did work, her job basically paid for me to go away to boarding school, which of course is where all the rich girls were. So it was like, I was totally confused because I knew we weren't them, but I, are we really that? And so, yeah, it's kind of funny, but anyways, enough of my things. Now, just to continue on, you talk about money personalities. Yes. So um, there are actually five distinct money personalities. And so just like you might have certain traits around your personality as a whole, you know, maybe you're an introvert or an extrovert, right? That would be a, a personality trait. There are also money personalities and there are five distinct money personalities. So I'll go through them real quickly. And at Money Mentor Group, we actually have a a quick assessment that people can take if they want to find out their own money personality. Um, And your money personality basically helps you understand why you do what you do with your money. So the first money personality we call the avoider. So an avoider is someone who doesn't even want to deal with their money, right? They don't want to look at their money. They don't want to look at their bills. They don't want to look at their checking account. They don't want to look at their statements. They just don't want to deal with it. And there can be a number of reasons for that, but that's the avoider. And I'm going quickly. Um, and again, if, if people take the money personality quiz, they get a much longer explanation and some exercises to do or whatever, but that's the avoider. Okay. So then we have the amasser. So the amasser feels happiness and joy and successful when they can look at their statements and they see a lot of money right? That makes them feel secure and successful and proud. And so they behave in a way where amassing money is a top priority for them. Now, closely aligned with that is the money hoarder. So a hoarder will also amass money, you know, very likely, but what's driving the money hoarder is the fact that when they have a lot of money, right, that's how they feel secure. It's not about looking at a statement and saying like, oh, I got a million bucks. It's the fact that that having the emergency fund and the resources at their disposal makes them feel secure. So they have a lot of trouble spending. When they spend, they typically will spend with guilt, right? Like, oh, I shouldn't be spending. I should be saving that money. We think of these people as maybe living very frugally. And then we have what's called the money monk. So a money monk has a mindset where they think money is evil. And if they have money, it'll corrupt their values and their standards. And so if a money monk comes into some money, maybe from an inheritance or some or a bonus or whatever, they're likely just to give it away because they feel like money will corrupt them. 
And then the last one is the spender. And you probably have a pretty good guess of what this is, but this is somebody who feels happiness and joy and good about themselves when they're spending because it's that spending that makes them feel good. And um, so I really encourage anybody who's interested in finding out kind of why they do what they do to kind of check out that money personality quiz. It's fascinating. Well, it's interesting too, because as you're going through my first thought, because you started with the avoider was Oh my God, that was me in 2007 when the, the investment statements would come in. I don't want to know, <laughs> you know, because I knew they were going south. And I had a drawer full of envelopes that had never been open just wow. because it just wasn't a, like I just knew yeah. it was going south. I didn't want to didn't want to deal with the pain. Yeah. Um, and I think we've all known. Yeah, the amasser. Yeah, the hoarders are interesting. Mm. Um, and once again, you know, I, 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 I was instantly thinking of people, seeing people in my lives that, that yeah. fit this. Um, the money monk. Yeah, I've known people who like and even sensible things like the selling of a house. Oh, my goodness. Now I have all this money. Um, and they were like, oh, my mother and father don't have that much. My brother didn't have that much. And they couldn't afford the next house. because yeah. They didn't at all. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. And then I guess like you, you know, once I started my own paychecks, I did become a spender. Very common, very, very common. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of times people will think that a financial coach works with people who don't have money. And it's actually the opposite. My typical client earns good money, but still struggles with you know, spending and living paycheck to paycheck and not being able to save. And maybe, you know, I work with couples where they have trouble communicating, right, or managing their money together. And so it's, it's surprising sometimes to people to find out that, you know, most of my clients, they know what they should be doing with their money. But it's just so hard, right? And that's where a coach can be really impactful. Um, I actually like to say that I'm similar to a personal trainer, but for your money. So, you know, if you were trying to get in shape, get uh, fit and healthy, maybe lose some weight, you would know what to do in your brain, right? I got to eat less. I got to go to the gym. I got to not be so sedentary. Like, you know what to do, right? Drink more water, whatever, right? But it's just so hard to do, right? Because it's hard to change those habits and, and change your mindset. So people would hire a personal trainer to help them on that journey. And that personal trainer, the role of that trainer would be, you know, to guide them, to mentor them, to teach them maybe exercises that are specific for them, to cheer them on, to hold them accountable, right? And it's the same thing with a financial coach, but for your money. Do you, and it was funny because I was waiting for that word accountable. Do you ever get pushback? Because, all the time. Okay. I was just wondering. All, yeah. All the time. It, it's, um, it's very normal because we all have a little battle between in, going on in, in ourselves, between what we know we should do and what we want to do. And it's funny with money because people can justify any expense, right? That is a bad decision and justify it and make it a good decision. So I'll give you an example, okay? And this was a, a client of mine. We just had this conversation, right? The, the client came to me and the client's doing great. I've worked with them for about a year. They've paid off a ton of debt. They're saving. They have an emergency fund now. They're doing a great job, right? The client um, came to me and said, you know, I think I need to buy a new car. And I said, oh, okay, so tell me, you know, about what you're thinking there, right? Because I will, I never tell my clients what to do. A good coach asks questions, right? right, right. Helps them self-discover, right? So I said, tell me why you, th you think you need to buy a new car. And the person said, well, you know, my car's getting kind of old. It's getting up there in miles. And it's just a matter of time before I'm either going to break down on the side of the road or it's going to need some costly repair. So I think I need to buy the new car now. So what came out through our conversations 
was they wanted to buy a new car because the car was starting to, you know, look old. It was running fine. It was just, you know, kind of from a image thing, like looking a little old. And so the question I asked is um, what you stated about possibly needing a big repair and possibly breaking down on the side of the road, those things are true. But isn't it also true that this car might run fine for another 20, 30,000 miles? Is that true as well? Which of course it was. And so that helped them think about, okay, could I drive this car for six more months? Am I willing to do that so I can save up, right? Can I, am I willing to drive it for another year and save up? So what kind of deal might you make with yourself that would allow you to feel the emotional joy that you want to in buying the shiny new fill in the blank versus doing the, the practical thing? So the two thoughts that came to mind as you were speaking there is, first of all, the, the five whys. You know, why do you want that? Why, why, why? But also then the fact that so many people, and I just did it myself, and I rarely do it, so I don't mind talking about it, was what I call retail therapy. You know, I had been in a workshop for a really intense workshop for three days. I hadn't seen the outside of my house except when I put my dog out. And I just went, I need a few things anyways. And I'm like, well, I guess I gave it away right there. Um, I was, didn't just go out and spend. It was like, okay, I need these things. T- today's the day I'm going to go shopping because I hate shopping. Um, but yeah, so retail therapy is. Uh, yeah, that's so I'm so glad that that you brought that up. So super common. Don't beat yourself up. We we all do it. Believe me, there are days where I run to TJ Maxx. I don't know if that's a store you have in Canada or Costco. I don't know if that's a store you have in Canada, but believe me, I, I do it too. But here's maybe something to think about. Very often from a mindset standpoint, we use the phrase, I deserve right? Mm -hmm. You know what? I've had a really tough week. I deserve to go shopping or I'm really stressed. I deserve to, you know, take a cruise, right? Or, you know, my husband and I are fighting a lot. You know what? We, We deserve to, I don't know, go out to dinner, right? Whatever. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. I would say, no, what you deserve is to have money in the bank. What you deserve is to have a secure financial future. Those are things that you deserve just as much as the material things. And so we have to be careful around that I deserve. So that's one thing I'll I'll say. The other thing when it comes to retail therapy is that if we can recognize that the reason, the why behind their retail therapy is that We're trying to make ourselves feel good about something that we feel bad about, right? So we have a negative emotion and that retail therapy is feeding that and making us feel good for a short period of time, even though, you know, the credit card bill comes and we're like, oh my gosh, 26 charges, what did I buy? And then we feel guilt, which is a negative emotion, right? If we can be conscious of it and recognize that emotion and do something else instead of that retail therapy, you know, take a hike, right? It's spring, right? Or, you know, bake ourselves a cake or, you know, whatever it is that will help us to reduce the amount of trips to the store that we make, (laughs) but no one is immune to it. Believe me. (laughs) Well, it's funny too, because in my own case, I thought, no, summer's summer's coming. Despite the fact we had snow here yesterday, we won't go there. But Oh my um, goodness. Oh, I know. So because I knew I wanted to pick up some new spring summer tops, it was like, okay, this is the day I'm going to go do it. And then of course I get to the store and I go, hmm, we're not out of COVID yet. None of the change rooms are open. If I can't try it on, I'm not going to buy it. (laughs) So it was like, okay, not that I use my credit card ever, but at least it never came out of my wallet. So it was great. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm a big proponent of something called me money. So when I created my budget 
And I don't even like to say the word budget because sometimes people think of budget and they think, oh, it's something that's restricting and, you know, depriving me of things I want. So I like to stay, say it's my spending and savings plan because somehow that sounds so much better. I have a plan. I'm just working my plan, right? Because I work with, I'll just if interject for a second here. Because I work with boomers, I created a, a fillable spreadsheet. Um, in Excel, I think it was. No, it doesn't matter. Anyways, and I called it my income outgone analyzer. <laughs> there you go. Right, right. So we, we won't say the B word. But in my plan, I have a certain amount of money every month that I call me money. And it's money that I get to blow on whatever I want. So and my husband has it too. He has his me money. And we've had that for as long as we've been married. And it's money that I can spend any way I want, and he can't say a thing. So if Amazon boxes show up at the door and he's thinking to himself, oh no, what did she order now? I just turn to him and go, me money. And he goes, okay, I don't care if it's shoes. I don't care if it's, you know, whatever. It's your me money, right? And so we build that into our budget. And what that does from an emotional standpoint is allow me to spend guilt-free, right? Because I budgeted it in. So that's something that I always recommend to my clients because it really kind of helps fill that emotional void that we all have. Everybody knows I come to our, my, our talks with, uh, with notes. And it's funny because I was actually just going to talk now about the financial literacy and where budgeting, credit, and debt fit together. Maybe we could sort of wander over to credit and debt a little bit. Sure. Sure. And um, April is actually Financial Literacy Month. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So we are recording this podcast in, in April 2022. Yeah. So perfect timing. So, um, yeah, credit and debt. Whew, we could talk for a long time about those. Um, but I'll just share a couple little tidbits. So, you know, sometimes people think that um, as a financial coach, I am going to say, cut up your credit cards or put them away. And actually not true at all. I use credit cards every single day. I mean, not every single day, but, you know, for all of my spending, because credit cards have um, rewards and points and different things that I use. So, I mean, my husband and I are flying to Houston. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. We're flying to Houston in September using points, right? So, but when I'm working with somebody who has a problem overspending or controlling their spending, what I suggest is that until they kind of retrain their brain, right, and build some new habits, they put the credit card away temporarily and use a debit card just until, again, they, they build the new habits and they're able to kind of self-control. Um, but I am not anti-credit card at all because I do believe there's a lot of value in, you know, the, the other, the points and the rewards, and sometimes they give you cash back, right? And using a credit card is important because that helps build your credit, which impacts your credit score. And a lot of people don't realize that having a high credit score not only allows you to borrow money if you need to for things like a mortgage or a car payment or, you know, something else that you might need to finance, but it also impacts how much your car insurance costs because a lot of people don't realize that your credit score is part of the algorithm for your car insurance and it can dictate where you live. There are some places that will not rent to you if you have a low credit score. And so having, you know, a a pretty decent credit score is really important. Now, when it comes to debt, I personally try to live as debt free as possible, uh, because if you buy things on debt, what that basically means is everything you bought is just costing you significantly more, Right. Right. So I am a big proponent of avoiding debt as much as possible. Um, But I also understand that for many people, that's just not possible. And so um, when I work with people who are looking to pay off debt as part of their money goals, there are definitely strategies that allow you to pay off debt faster and with less interest. And that's one of the things that um, I teach my um, clients 
We do have a, a course on our website, the Money Mentor Group website, which goes into this in a lot of detail if anybody wants to check that out. But there are definitely strategies for paying off your debt faster and with less interest. Mm. And it's funny, I want to interject because I'm one of those people that I never had air miles because I didn't want to be tracked with my, my spending, et cetera. But in this day and age, it's like if you carry a phone or you use any card under the sun, they yeah. are all knowing, all seeing. So, you know, I, I've gotten off my high horse since then, obviously. But uh, yeah. yeah, I know there's still people out there who go like, I don't want them to know. And it's like, they know. Trust me, they know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are people who want to live completely off the grid. I am. Um, I think that's be, that's harder and harder to do. You know, if you have a computer, you're not off the grid. Exactly. So, yeah. I want to just go sideways slightly here, and I guess this is more of an. Well, maybe I should let you answer. I was going to say perhaps for you, it's more of just an opinion piece. But one of my pet peeves is education. And I think I didn't do probably a bang up job of financially educating my children. Fortunately, I think they've all figured it out for themselves. Phew. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But what, what are your feelings about the fact that like in school, to my knowledge, there's not many schools that will help prepare kids with budgeting and living within your means and what is good debt and what is bad debt and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up because it is a very much a taboo subject in a lot of families where parents very often feel uncomfortable talking about money in any way, shape or form with their children. And they're really doing their children a disservice by not educating them. I will say that in the United States, there is a slow, quiet movement to bring financial literacy into high schools. And several states have now made, uh, made it mandatory in, on the high school level to take a financial literacy class where they teach you exactly what you said, budgeting oh, wow. and how credit works and how debt works and what is a credit score and all of that. So there is slowly, slowly, we are <laughs> getting there. Okay. But I do think that it's very important to teach your children about how money works um, because if we don't, our children end up in debt with low credit scores and, you know, no savings. Um, I know my husband and I were probably, uh, you know, we were the other end of the spectrum. I felt like all we talked about was money. You know, we, we were very transparent. You know, we, we didn't tell them how much we earned, but as an example, when it came time to go to college, we sat them down And we said, this is how much we have saved for college. And we showed them the statements and we explained how much we had been putting away every month since they were born and where it was invested and how it grew over time. And we said, this is your budget. And we said, you know, this is enough where you can go to an in-state school, an in-state public school. If you want to go elsewhere, you have a couple choices. You can end up in debt because you'll have to take out loans. And here's what that will look like for you. And we laid it out. Or you can get scholarships, right? So you better start applying. (laughs) (laughs) And interestingly enough, all of our children either chose to go to the in-state school so they wouldn't have student debt or got scholarships. But all of them graduated with no student debt. Oh, excellent. Yeah. My story around that was after my former husband and I divorced and I bought my first house by myself is money was scary tight. Mm. And I think the the children would, I had three kids and they would sort of be concerned about this because we couldn't afford this and we couldn't afford that. And so I said, look at, there's a bottle of wine on the counter over there. The weekend that I don't buy myself a bottle of wine is the weekend that you might want to worry 
Well, of course, then every weekend it's like, okay, I don't know where the money's coming from, but I've got to make sure there's a bottle of wine on there because I didn't want them worrying. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's funny. So... You know, it, it, it's funny because when our, we, I have four children, you know, that's a lot of kids, right? Yeah, to yeah. raise and, you know, and my husband and I both always worked, right? You know, both of us, but we, we had a goal of being able to retire early. And, you know, I, I retired from corporate America in my early fifties. Um, and I'm now a financial coach. I, I don't call myself retired. I call myself work optional. So we had a goal of being able to retire early, which meant that we had to maximize our income, live very frugally and save, you know, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, aggressively. And, you know, certainly we didn't live as frugally as we could have. I mean, we owned a home, we had two cars, you know, we, I mean, you know, our kids went to summer camp, like they, you know, it's not like we were living like rice and beans every night, you know, type thing, mac and cheese, you know, Um, we had some small luxuries, but our kids would always complain everywhere we went right? If we went out for a day, we went to a lake, we went to a beach, we went to an amusement park. We always brought sandwiches. Like we always brought our food with us because, you know, to feed two adults and four children at an amusement park or on a boardwalk, my gosh, right? So they would always say, when I grow up, I'm not bringing my food. I'm going to eat out, right? Well, the hilarious thing is My kids now range from ages 21 to 31. So my youngest is still in college, but the three older ones are young working adults. And all of them, when they go out, they bring their food. (laughs) So my husband and I just chuckle. (laughs) Yeah, my brother, my brother's son, my nephew, uh, he's full-fledged adult now. Like, uh, but when he was a teenager, he went to school with like the doctor's kids and the lawyer's kids. And way back then, I'm really aging him. Um, it was like the guys all wore the silk shirts and stuff like that. And he was always ticked off because his mom and dad, I'm going to say wouldn't afford it. I don't know if they couldn't, but I, they yeah. wouldn't afford it. So he felt really hard done by. It. But he also played soccer. And one time he took a trip down to a developing world. Uh, to play soccer down there and they were taking like old uniforms and old shoes and old balls down to this developing country by the time he got back he never complained again Mm, interesting so it was a really interesting eye-opener and you know sometimes you just sort of wish that more people who think they're hard done by could experience what hard done by really looks like yeah yeah so so but Okay, um, I'm big on black and white myself, uh, real numbers written out, um, so the money can come in and go out only once, like my income outgone analyzer. Some of the boomer women I know had so little idea of the real bottom line that after retirement, they were literally selling vehicles, even selling their homes to make ends meet because they had never figured it out. Is is in your world? Is that unusual? Like I, maybe I don't know how many boomer age people or pre boomers that you talk to or pre retirement people you talk to, but is that sort of lack of basic knowledge of bottom line? Unfortunately, it's not uncommon. You know, when I think back to my mother's generation, women did not work outside the home very much, right? It wasn't like it is today. Um, And the men handled all the finances. And so when our mothers were raising us, some of that trickled down, whether we want to admit it or not. My mother was unusual in that When I was in high school, she went back to work. She went and got a master's degree and went back to work. And my mother really took over the finances because my dad was an avoider. He he just didn't even want to deal with it, right? Um, And my mom was really the one who controlled a lot of the finances um, in our house, which was unusual. But what has happened today with you know, our age, right? Women in their 50s, 60s, even 70s. I don't know how the the exact years of the boomer generation, you probably know better than I do. But 
you know, some of the women may have worked outside the home, may have not, may have had their own money, may have been in control of their money, but very few women in that boomer generation were taught about money and taught about investing and talked about even things like, how do you maximize your social security? And what, you know, I'll give you a great example. I know somebody who she is 68. I want to say her husband's in his early seventies and they were both collecting social security, which I know you don't have that in Canada, but that's the same thing. You have something similar, right? It's the government benefit, right? Okay. Um, What do you call it in Canada? Do you know? Old age security. Okay. Oh, that's right. I couldn't think of it. Thank you. And her husband passed away. And so now she was only receiving her social security. Half of her income went away. And she was like, oh my gosh, I still have the same mortgage. That didn't go away when he passed away, right? I still have the same utility bills. Like a lot of her expenses are the same. So their plan of what they were going to live on in retirement all of a sudden that just, you know, poof. Right. And so I don't think that educating women around money um, and, and talking about it and helping women empower themselves with money is enough in the conversation. Hopefully these conversations can change that a little bit. Yeah. And I think too, that because you know, we get so used to whether it's old age security. We also have something, you probably have a similar thing. We have the Canada pension plan, which you pay into through your working years. Now, as you've just said, a lot of boomer women were full-time homemakers. They were not employed outside the home. So they don't qualify for that. So as a retired person, you're not making enough to even pay the rent. Believe you me. So, but a lot of people don't realize it's like, oh no, the government will keep me. It'll be fine. I'll have my pension, you know, and, and then to suddenly realize that, oh my goodness. Right. Um, You know, I think something else is changing though, in that it used to be that retirement meant you don't work at all. You stop working, right? The door closes on your working, whatever that is. And now you're in this new phase, retirement. And it's, you know, visions of, you know, taking long walks into the sunset and playing golf and sitting on your front porch or whatever your vision of retirement is. But you know what? We are healthier and we are living longer. And so I really believe that the retirement vision of years ago is different now. I know so many people who are retired, quote unquote, but they are so active and they still work, but they do different things. Maybe they work in a little boutique because that's fun, right? Or they do some consulting or, you know, whatever it is to supplement whatever retirement income they have. And I think that, you know, people can do that well into their 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, again, assuming their health, right? And so I think that vision of retirement is just, it's different now. Yeah. And once again, I think the important thing is just to, to be aware and, and start looking at these options before you pull the plug yeah. on that nine exactly. to five. Exactly. Yeah. 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 My spreadsheet actually looks at, you can plug in all your income and then it all bounces down to the bottom where you plug in what you know you will be getting from your pensions and then is the bottom line in red ink or black ink, you know, so oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any other stories about people approaching retirement, given that we're talking to boomers here? Yeah, you know, I, I always go back to mindset because, you know, the there's from a dollars and cents standpoint, I mean, there's so many amazing free calculators online and resources online and you know, and that looks at the numbers and the budgets and, and, you know, some of that, but I go back to mindset and what people typically find in retirement is that they are spending way more than they thought they would, because think about this. What's the day of the week that most people spend the most money Saturday, 
It's because it's the day we go shopping. We go out to dinner. We play golf. Well, when you're retired, every day is Saturday. So a lot of people find that they are spending a lot more than they anticipated. And so my advice to people is before they leave corporate America, really have a good idea of what you spend every month and try to keep your, exp- your, you know, your expenses low in retirement and make sure that you are being honest with yourself about how you envision your retirement, what you envision doing, because then you'll know, you know how much you need to spend. And you may have to delay retirement a couple years you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, right? But you may have to re- delay retirement for a couple of years in order to have the retirement, you know, vision life that, that you want, or do this kind of hybrid retirement where, you know, you still work part time in some way. So just some thoughts there as people approach retirement. I think too, part of the problem, correct me if I'm wrong, is that tap card. That tap debit card, tap credit card. Yeah. You know, if someone's picking up a, a latte and a muffin five days a week and a couple of magazines, that's probably what ten bucks a day for the, the lattes and muffin and probably getting close to ten bucks per magazine these days. Yeah. I mean, it all of these little things yeah. that we say to ourselves, it's only, it's only, right? It's only ten bucks, it's only ten bucks, right? But they they all add up. So we, we kind of, that's another kind of money mantra that when people start saying it's only, it's only, I kind of go time out. Okay. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> you almost need an app that will log the number of times yeah. you say it's only. You know, exactly. Bucks, you know, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. But, but, you know, that phrase it's only that can work both ways because in our mind, we can say it's only 10 bucks. It's only five bucks. But sometimes we self-sabotage the good things that we do with this phrase, it's only. We say to ourselves, oh, I only saved $100 in my retirement plan. Bad girl, right? Or, oh, you know, I only paid off $100 extra in debt, right? So we need to be careful around the it's only because what that does is it diminishes everything that we do, both the good things and the bad things. I'll add to that, too, because where I thought you were going there is mortgage, for example. Well, I can only afford to put 25 bucks, you know, twice a week or twice a month on my mortgage. That's nothing. What's the point? Right. Put 25 bucks on your mortgage twice a week after 10 years. It's yeah. a, chunk, a chunk of money. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And even, I guess, going into retirement fund, it's only 25 bucks. Well, guess what happens? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Alisa, I feel that the subject of money could go on for several episodes, but are there any important points that we haven't touched on that you think boomer, should, boomer women should know or learn? Yeah, I'd say my final thoughts are, don't think that it's too late. Mm. Um, so many boomer women that I talk to feel like it's too late. I I haven't saved enough. I'm never going to be able to retire. I'm going to, you know, live a life of poverty. It's it's too late. And if there's one message that I can send to your listeners, it's that it's not too late. It's never too late. And so if you're looking to kind of change um, your financial future, Start with the baby steps, right? Start what you can do today because any change in behavior for the positive is going to have a positive impact. And so um, I would encourage your listeners to just kind of, if, if you're feeling like it's too late, think about you know the fact that you're just starting because really as boomer women, we have a long life ahead of us. Yeah. And I'm just going to go back to now to your difference, your differences between the financial coach and the financial advisor, because having talked to you now for 45 minutes or whatever it's been, um, obviously a financial coach, is, you, you're worth your weight in gold. But the other thing I did learn from my own financial advisor 
is that as women, you know, because sometimes we don't know enough or whatever, um, that some men, I'm going to be real careful here, some men can sound intimidating. So you can, in fact, shop around for the financial advisor that you want Perhaps it's absolutely. a woman, perhaps it's yeah, a Absolutely. You have to find somebody who connects with you on an emotional level, not just they've got lots of plaques hanging on the wall behind their desk. So yeah, you have to find somebody that you feel like you can talk to, relate to, that understands you, because that relationship um, you know, with a financial advisor um, is so important. Um, you know, mo- money's too important not to get right. You probably may have heard that before. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. And once again, honesty is the best policy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, just being straight goods with the, about it all. Okay. You've alluded a couple of times to some of the things you have on your website. What are some of the tools and uh, things that you have and where is your website? Sure. Well, our website is www.moneymentorgroup.com moneymentorgroup.com. And you can go on our website and do a number of things. One, anybody can set up a free 15 minute clarity call, which is a 15 minute consultation with one of our financial coaches to see if financial coaching is right for you. Right? So that's one thing. There are tons of free resources. We have a whole freebies kind of section with all kinds of different worksheets and calculators and exercises for you to do. And we have several self-paced courses. We have the money personality quiz, and that is under $10, right? It is cheap, 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 so that anybody can learn more about why they do what they do. Um, We have a course called Mastering Your Debt, which teaches you all kinds of tips and secrets and strategies to pay off your debt quicker and with less interest. That is less than a hundred bucks. And then we have a third course called Master Your Money Management, which um, teaches you all about how to manage your money on an everyday basis and the mindset behind some of those money management techniques. Um, We are introducing new courses all the time. Uh, We also have a monthly newsletter. And on the website, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is free. And you get all kinds of great resources every month from there. Okay. And I, before we close, I really want to backtrack. And at the beginning, I was sort of differentiating between countries and things like that. But having talked to you now, I really understand the, how you put it, that a financial coach is a financial coach in terms of it doesn't matter what country you live in, the hangups and the bangups and the baggage that we bring with us is, is yeah. universal. And that's what you help us with. So good. Okay, I'm going to make sure that your links are online. Um, that's great. Listeners, if you have comments on today's show, you can leave them where you're listening And of course, we can be found at Apple or Google or Spotify. Most places a person would listen to podcasts. Of course, there's always a website, twoboomerwomen.com. To leave your comments there, click the Join the Conversation tab. Leave stars and reviews. They help us grow. Before you go, hit the subscribe or follow button, and you'll be notified about future interviews with more of my great guests. And share this episode with two friends you think would benefit from a bit more financial knowledge and coaching around mindset. If you want to be a guest on the podcast or know someone who would, there's an application form at the website too. Alisa Locke, thank you so much for being my guest today and sharing so much information. You really clarified a whole bunch of things and I appreciate that. It was my absolute pleasure. Have a great rest of week. <laughs>